Mother Knows Death, starring Nicole and Jemmy and Maria QK. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mother Knows Death. Let's get started with the story of the week. So this first one's really messed up. So this guy was going to a 4th of July party at a bar. I guess he had bought a ticket. He arrives at the bar and the bouncer said he was too drunk to come in. So if they're noticing that at the door, like how messed up is this guy, right? Yeah, totally. So they offered to refund him the ticket, which I was surprised by because no matter what bar I worked at, if somebody showed up like that, they would have just been like your beat. But they really wanted to get this guy out and didn't want him to come in. So they turn him away. He ends up getting in the car, starts driving through the Lower East Side of Manhattan, hops onto a sidewalk and plows through a group of 11 people, killing three. Now, my question is, and obviously this is this guy's fault, and there's way more to the story, which makes the story, it, it kind of pisses you off even more. But my first question is, just because you worked at a bar and stuff, if you have somebody that comes and is visibly drunk like that, that you don't want to serve or you don't want to let in, why why is it okay to just say, I'm refusing you entry and be on your way, knowing that there's a high probability that that person came in a car? Well, you don't know they came in a car because this happened in New York City, so you can't assume somebody drove. I mean, I worked at a bar that was in more of a neighborhood section of Philadelphia, but a lot of people also did walk there, and you had no way of knowing if somebody drove there unless you physically saw them got, get in and out of a car. And because of everything going on in cities right now, even if you called the cops and you were like, I have this extremely intoxicated person, the likelihood of the cops even coming are slim to none. So you have to think about that. I know. It's just it's just fucked up because I'm like, if this if somebody would have just called the cops on this guy and he wasn't even able to get in his car. Well, because they can't do if they, they just won't do anything about it. Like, it's just as plain and simple as that. They have bigger problems. So if this happened in a really small town like where we live now. There's more of a likelihood that they would have come and taken care of it. But like if he's just showing up drunk, if he's not necessarily doing anything, what are they going to do? But in my opinion, like they don't have bigger problems because this guy killed three people. So it's essentially the same as someone shooting three people or what, whatever. Like this is this is a serious crime. He killed three people in one sitting. So like they don't have bigger problems. This is a big problem. Yeah. And I, it happened in New York a, a couple of times this week. Right. With the. Yeah, the I'm guy just, with the nail salon. I'm just thinking about a couple. We had to call the cops a couple times. And one of them was, you know, we were like on this intersection and a drunk driver actually, I feel like almost plowed into our outdoor tables, but pulled over right before them and then got out and started dancing in the middle of the street and peed his pants like in front of everybody. This is at three o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday and the police station was literally half a block away from the bar and we called them and they didn't get there for like 20 minutes. So in that 20 minutes, unless somebody's physically restraining the, this guy, what are we going to do? I mean, this guy peed his pants, so the likelihood that somebody's even going to touch him is slim. All right, so let's get to the bottom line then. There's no obligation for the bar to call the cops and just say, hey, there's this guy that just came in who's piss-ass drunk. He's so drunk we can't even serve well, him, I and think, we just turned him away. Yeah, and I think like they can. It's up to the bar, but I don't think the cops are going to do anything about it. Anyway, the worst part of this story is this guy says he's a counselor, and he wrote this book called The Sober Addict where he was trying to help people overcome addictions and how to move forward with their lives. Yeah. And I, I think that this is a great thing that people do because there are a lot of addicts that, that come out and they write books or they give tips on how they overcame their problems. But clearly, this guy didn't overcome his problems. And I saw on his book that there was a there was a recommendation or a forward by a, a physician and or some kind of a doctor. And I just wonder how that person feels that they that they have their name now attached to this book of this guy when I'm not really sure that he ever became sober. It seems like his his ex-girlfriend or wife left him because he was an alcoholic. This is the mother of his child. Yeah. She knew, she said that she knew he was going to kill somebody. Like, how, So that means she knew he was drinking and driving all the time. And kudos for her for leaving him and getting her child out of that situation. But it's, 
it's weird that you could just come out with a book like this when you're kind of lying about it. Well, it almost seems like this book was self-published and there is a section that this article referenced where he said that his stints in jail were, quote, humbling, de demeaning, and enlightening. And there was a sense of finality when those, quote, metal doors clinked behind me. But like, how enlightening was it if you just kept doing it? And now you're definitely going to be in jail the rest of your life. And this is just another story where we hear some drunk driver killed a bunch of people and they made it out with a couple bruises on their face. It's just amazing to me how this happens. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, th this guy obviously had a history of it. Th the most disturbing part for me was like him writing this book and people reading it only for him to like not take his own advice and just go on to do something absolutely horrible. So I don't know. It's it's sickening he to sucks. think about. Yeah. All right, let's get on to celebrity news. All right, so Danny Elfman is this composer. He's He has to be one of the most famous composers in the movie and TV industry, right? I mean, he did The, si the Simpsons. I can't talk. The Simpsons theme song. He worked on most, I think, almost every single Tim Burton movie, right? Yeah, so you, you'll recognize the theme song for Beetlejuice, Batman, the all of the Corpse Bride, all those types of movies, every single movie, P I Pee Wee too, right? Yeah, he's the sing Like all of them. He's also the singing voice of Jack Skellington from Nightmare Before Christmas. Well, he's he's gross. Yeah. He's like, a, he looks gross, but I, I guess like, I guess when I look at him, I'm like, ew, just because I know about the weird shit he does. Yeah, so, I mean, he, he has this kind of like, creepy vibe to him but like you can't just assume somebody's disgusting based on how they look especially because mm, he works in I do this, that like horror industry kind of or like doing these weird movies but these accusations are really not helping his case so it appears he's being sued for the third time by this other composer he worked with between 2015 and 2016 so Nami Abadi is the I, I think I hope that's the right way to pronounce her name it was like all over the place in the press so she first sued Danny Elfman after he allegedly sexually harassed her, exposing himself and masturbating in front of her several times, which is horrible in itself, but it just keeps getting worse. So he agreed to pay her this settlement and sign an NDA. And then it looks like she sued him a second time for failing to pay the settlement that they agreed upon. And then last summer, he did an article with Rolling Stone where he was talking about the incident and basically alluded that she was lying about all of it and that she was this scorned woman seeking revenge. So now she is suing him once again for defamation, saying he was blatantly lying in this article, spreading these horrible lies, saying that she was making it up. It's been affecting her getting work. And the most disturbing part of this whole thing is that Rolling Stone found this police report and said that he never, quote, never placed his bodily fluids in a martini glass that he presented to her like what excuse me yeah so he put his semen in a martini glass and tried to serve it to her but then didn't he try to say that it was cetaphil lotion yeah he came out later saying that it was cetaphil and that she knew it was a prop i guess they were using for a photo shoot which side note he was like forcing you you have to think about the power dynamic here right she is like this young composer trying to work with this guy that's famous in the industry worked on all these major projects and he's like showing her all these weird naked pictures he has with other people and then saying that she needs to do them with him and you know when you're a young person in the industry you're scared right like you're like well this guy's my boss and like he could affect my whole future so i'm just gonna and he's, he's like a huge big deal. Yeah, he's a really big deal. So we see this a lot with all these big, you know, with the Me Too movement and everything. This has been a problem with these like high up executive guys taking advantage of women. And they're like, oh, well, they consented. Well, maybe they did because they were scared to death of what was going to happen to them. It doesn't make I it also right. Don't, I don't trust any any guy that will will jerk off in front of a woman and w against her will that she doesn't want that to happen he's just kind of like hey look at this he he definitely put it in a mug or a martini glass or whatever like you you have this limit of pushing things that's that a normal dude wouldn't do that but a normal dude also wouldn't just go up to some random person and start jerking off in front of them so I don't believe anything he says, and I'm glad she's suing him because he's such a big name. And going in Rolling Stone, 
all these people are going to read it and then they're going to believe him and not her. It's it's fucked up. Yeah. And what's this is where it's really hard. Be, defamation lawsuits are really difficult because you have to really prove that what this person said about you, like affected your life, affected you making money and got you fired from jobs or gave you a rep reputation. So her attorneys have a lot right to work with to try to prove this case. But this is just disgusting that this accusation's even out there. And then in October last year, another person that he worked with came forward and said that between like 1997 and 2002, on several occasions when they would meet or work together, he would expose himself and do pretty much the same thing. So he said nudity was part of his creative process. He would open the door with his robe undone, like disgusting. And he just looks so gross. I believe it just based on the way he looks. Sorry. He has I'm very judging. bright orange hair and like a berries and cream and Lord Farquaad haircut and like <laughs> and pasty white skin. And he just looks he just looks like a creepster. And honestly, this is really like a bummer for me to Lord read. Farquaad. <laughs> this, he really died he really does. This is such a bummer for me to read because like growing up I loved Tim Burton Project so much. I love Danny Elfman's music. This is like I'm married to a ginger. This is not good for our <laughs> communities. Like I don't know. That it, it really bums me out, but like I mean, the, the biggest headline in this is this guy serving his semen in a martini glass. Like, what is wrong with you, dude? On all levels, this is wrong. But like, you're you're just taking it too many, too far. I just I just keep visualizing it, which is grossing me out even more. It's just with like him, his grossness. Right. Think about like his red Lord Farquhar hair and his pasty <laughs> white skin wearing a silk robe, holding a martini glass filled with his semen like ugh. No, I'm picturing seriously. I, in general, bodily fluids skeeve me out more than anything, and the, this whole scene of like the the creepy presence he generally has mixed with the story and everything. I don't know. This is really disturbing, and it, it's like this lady has been tortured enough to stop bringing her up in the media. And if you signed an NDA, why are you talking about it? I'm, I don't right, know. Let's get on. Let's get on the freak accidents. All right, so we, you know, we were talking about in six shocking stories this week, like all these firework incidents we've been getting sent, and this one story kept showing up in our inbox, which is about this father in South Carolina who was drinking all day. He's seen in video wearing an Uncle Sam, like red and white stripe with blue star American outfit, dancing around the front yard. You see fireworks going off in the street, and then apparently, sometime after this viral video was taken he had been quote showboating and had lit a firework over his head only for it to explode over his head and kill him yeah and apparently his family witnessed this happening yeah like i, I mean it's yeah it's just so fireworks we we've heard a bunch of stories this this week of course we knew that was going to happen right we've yeah. heard a bunch of fire there was a forest fire near us caused by fireworks there was a really cool old Victorian house that got burned down because of actually a professional firework display, which is even scarier. And we heard about this guy. We heard about a bunch of people blowing off their digits and stuff, of course. And then this guy who who set it off on his head. So the most common cause of injury with fireworks like would be blunt trauma. So he probably had a traumatic brain injury due to this explosion so close to his head. I mean, just wh what do you say? just I don't know and it, I can't it's it's hard for me to even feel bad about this because it's just it's just ridiculous I don't even know why the things are legal honestly but they make a ton the government makes a ton of money off of them that's why well you know now that we did that dissection about um Matisse Kavlenix all I could think about is what the experts were saying that you should be a minimum of 50 feet away and just watching this video you see this guy is only a couple feet and you certainly shouldn't be lighting them and holding them in your hand for a long time right so all i could think about is if you just if you have the desire to use them just be safe about it yeah i definitely think that the injuries would be cut 75 percent if people just followed that 50 feet rule yeah because a lot, most of the injuries that we do see are hands, fingers, and and it's like, why is the flame anywhere near your hand while that thing's going off, you know? I mean, even think about it at the ballpark. So what was it? Two weeks ago, they had a fireworks display at the one game we went to, and they were doing it at the casino, which is 
like in the parking lot of the casino, which is behind Citizens Bank Park. And then they made the whole entire outfield seating clear out before the show started because they don't even want to risk it falling on somebody or somebody yeah. getting hurt. Well, they, they should. That's what you should do. Yeah, exactly. So I think people just, I mean, we're not going to like beat a dead horse, right? Like it, they're dangerous and you just need to be careful and not especially be intoxicated around them. Well, this is probably... I'm I'm assuming that we will not be talking about this until next July. Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's kind of like this. We'll have another we do a, pop around Labor Day, and then it will go away until yeah. Memorial Day. I think that um, this particular episode, it seems like we have a couple accidents that are um, summer-related things. Yeah, this being one of them. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's it's like beating a dead horse and we'll just talk about the same stories again next year. It's just whatever, like I'm over it. So let's, I'm getting bored of it at this point. Let's talk about something else. All right, so this one is a total freak accident. I mean, most of these are, but I feel like some of these are preventable sometimes. But this guy in North Dakota owned a bar. There was a like small little bowling alley attached to it with only two lanes. He was. It seemed like he was trying to you know rejuvenate the place restore the lanes and he was by himself when he was working on one of the bowling alley lanes and the pin setter unfortunately went off and crushed him to death it's it's kind of amazing that these accidents happen more frequently than you would think i found a bunch of osha reports so that's a report when a person dies at a business and they do an investigation to see like if it could have been prevented was it a machine error was it a human error things like that and i found a bunch of deaths, like crushing deaths like this. I found strangulation deaths. So that would be like if somebody's shirt or necktie got caught in the machine and pulled them into it. And if you remember a couple years ago, the cake boss, Buddy Valestro, yeah, he had that serious injury where the pin setter kept impaling his hand three times. To the, and then luckily his kids were right there and they were able to get a saw and cut the thing off of his hand. But it was his dominant hand and and really caused lifelong injuries to him. Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder if this is, these issues happen a lot with people with bowling alleys inside of their homes because they try to fix them themselves like him or like they'll just go to get something that's stuck out and then these horrible things happen. I mean, it sucks because... It seemed like this guy was really proud of this place and everybody in town was excited to see the renovations he was doing. And then it just happened so quickly. And I feel like this also stresses the importance of you shouldn't work on mechanical things when you're alone because if something yeah. happens, like what if I Buddy was alone, right? Would he have been able to get out of it so easily? Well, I think the most important thing is that you you go to a bow bowling alley, you don't even think about these things because you see the front of the machine that's barely sticking out, that's in the back. Yeah. And you wouldn't just go work at a factory and work on such a, a, a machine that is capable of, of hurting you that bad without proper training. And um, uh, actually, a lot of those, when I was saying the OSHA reports, like an OSHA report wouldn't be done on a, in a home death like that. So these were all at businesses and things, but... If people aren't trained properly on the equipment that they're using, then they can get really hurt. And that is a common one you see, especially the strangulation things. That's why when you work at places and you're a woman or something, or even a dude, I guess, could have long hair. They tell you to pin your hair up because your hair could get caught in a machine and and pull your head into it, you know? Yeah. Or any loose clothing, if you have a shirt with long sleeves or a necktie on or something like that. So... They're, and you could just think that maybe they just hire a person to work there and they don't really give them the proper training or whatever. Maybe this guy didn't have the proper training, whatever happened. It, and it is a freak accident. It's just sad. Yeah, totally. And then going back to our earlier conversation about like unique summer incidents we talk about in the United States. I don't know if other countries do carnivals like we do here, but, you know, they like bring these rides that are barely put together in the first place on like trucks down the highway do you ever just see one driving on the highway yeah ricky actually texted me the other day and was like i just saw a swinging pirate ship go by me <laughs> when I was driving to work so you know they transport these rides and they'll assemble them for a couple days and they take them down i feel like there's not a lot of like regulation and safety going on with them so in washington this carnival was happening and they set up all the standard rides which is like the Gravitron, the Zipper, and then this one in the incident called the Cyclone. 
Didn't you have an incident on the zipper? Yeah, well, yeah, that I threw up really bad all over my friend. <laughs> Every time I see it, I'm traumatized. But like, I just saw one. You know, there was a carnival outside of the Phillies game a couple weeks ago. Yeah, and I'm just walking, and I see it says the zipper, and I'm like, oh my god! And what was because it's a it's a um, I would say it's a Ferris wheel type of thing, and then each individual car turns upside down as well. And you're in like a cage kind of. But so, all right. So your incident with this happened in like the early 90s, right? Yeah. And I threw up in my mouth, right? (laughs) Because I I just knew I was going to get sick. I threw up and I held my mouth shut. And I remember holding my mouth shut filled with vomit. And I'll just like never forget that terrible feeling. And then I just had to let it out because it was like forced. And when I got off the ride... I went up to like the the popcorn stand, like nobody would give me a napkin. And it was at the Echelon Mall. I remember I had to go into Boscov's. I puke all over me and was like begging someone to help me because I just I was like, where is the bathroom? Like, could you imagine? I I was 13 or 12, like not helping a kid at a carnival. It's just fucked up. Yeah, it is. But yes. (laughs) So my point is, so this happened to you in what, like 1991, 1992? So this These rides look like they're still from that time. Like, they don't even look like they're being updated at all. So they set up this ride called the Cyclone, which is one of those, like, swinging rides. You know, Like, it's one of those ones that are swings that lifts up and swirls kids around. Whatever. I don't even know how to describe this accurately. If anybody's been to a carnival, they know what I'm talking about. So anyway, there's people, like, standing by the ride, and it's making this horrible screeching noise. Did you watch the video of this noise this thing was making? Oh, I didn't even realize that there was a video. I, I heard someone say it was, like, clicking and stuff, but... Oh, no, it's could, not just You clicking. could definitely tell it was, like, messed up when you hear it. Yeah, this, per- this person that took all these videos and pictures of before and after the incident took a video of it, and it was making, like, an... Like, I don't know. It was just such like an ear piercing, screeching noise. I would never let my kid on that ride with it making that noise. But also the the ride operator wasn't like, hey, well, the ride operator is always a a high 13 year old. That's what I'm saying. Like Like, these people that run the carnival rides, like most of the time, they're just like teenagers that are high at work or drunk and they they don't or they just don't care. Like they're totally unqualified people running these rides. So you know, this ride's making the screeching noise. Nobody thinks anything about it. They put more people on it. And then, shocker, the whole thing tips over with people on it. And it hurts a bunch of people. At least nobody got killed. We could say that. No, nobody um, got killed. But six people had injuries from it. I go back and forth with, with amusement rides. Because when I was, a, especially these, like, semi-permanent ones. I When I was a kid, I loved the, when the carnival came to town. You know, like... <laughs> My like my parents took us on vacation every year. But when the carnival came to the church, like it was something that we all looked forward to going to. So I don't want to take that away from my kids. We're even going to the mountains in a couple weeks and there's a carnival there. And of course, I'm like, this is the type of place that this happens at. But my kids are going to want to go on the ride. So I go back and forth. But then I'm like, oh, there's also 30,000 people that get injured on rides every year and and well, these are more likely, I feel. Yeah, I just think, like, these are so much more different than amusement park rides. Think about it. Like, when you have a ride built at Disney or Dollywood or Dorney Park or something, right? Like, it's built by professional engineers. It's built on site. The ride is not moving. They're being checked regularly every day, once a month, whatever. They're saying they set up these carnivals and they're not inspected by any agency. So, like, Elle and I inspected the rides after the incident happened. Like, why aren't they being inspected before people are allowed on them? And then, you know, they're being driven around in tractor trailers. That's probably knocking stuff loose in them. Do you think the teenagers managing them give a shit about what's going on? Like, no. Gabe is always, like, telling me that I need to calm down when the kids go on rides because... When the, whenever they go on, I like follow them right up to the ride and I make sure that they like double check their seatbelt that it's clicked in because I'm just I, I just am always envisioning something terrible happening with them. And it gives, you know, they went on the swings on the boardwalk a couple of weeks ago and the whole time I just had a knot in my stomach and I'm like, oh, my God, I just hate this so bad. I mean, literally, like 
These rides in this picture of this incident look like they were built in the 80s and have not been updated since. And they've been traveling to different carnival to different carnival every single week for summers for 40 years. Right. Think about this. Yeah. I, I mean, if you it's just this is the same as everything else, though. It's like if you think about how many people go on rides and how many times they go on rides a year, the, the amount of injuries is it is small. You just yeah. think of. I think a big fear for for any b- parent is that their kids get hurt doing something that's supposed to be fun, like swimming or something they didn't like getting hurt in a car accident. It's like sometimes you have to be in the car to go somewhere. Y- you have to be in the car, but like you don't have to be on these rides and it's a preve- it's a completely preventable death, but also you want to live you and you want your kids to have fun you know you you enjoyed it i don't know if you ever enjoyed rides but <laughs> i did go on them. most ki- most children do do so i fear being a mother cuz i'm just like <laughs> like i <laughs> thank god thank god you have me to 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 square you away and on top of that like and i'm kind of i i i'm pretty okay i i put the anxiety on myself not them but but i am constantly anxious but no like i think I, I leave it inside. I think if I was at a carnival, I'd have pretty much no problem letting my kid go on like the normal little kid ride. Like I wouldn't let them go on the Gravitron or the Zipper or anything like that. But I would have. Yeah, but like you're that's fine when your kid's two. You could let them on the little fire truck that goes, uh, you know, 0.5 miles an hour around the circle. But what my the kids now, the girls are nine and 11 years old. Like they don't want to go on that shit. They want to go on like the extreme stuff. You know no, what I totally. Mean? But like if you were standing in front of the ride and it was screeching like that, I think as a parent, you'd be like, maybe let's skip this. one. Yeah, exactly. Well, think about there had to be some people there that were like, eh, and then imagine it falling and being like, wow, I was right, actually. I, I yeah, I don't know. This episode is brought to you by The Gross Room. Guys, you have to join the gross room. You'll love it. All of these stories that we talk about every week on Mother Knows Death and Six Shocking Stories, we have lots of photos and videos that really show you what these kind of injuries look like. And especially talking about firework injuries and stuff, we don't just show the photos of the injuries. We also describe why they look like that, why fireworks might look different than for example, if you were had a blast injury from an IED or something like that. So we show you what what the difference is between, you know, an injury that's caused by blunt trauma versus something that's caused by sharp trauma. And it really it really just it, it's it's a great learning experience to to just add on top of all of these stories every week. Yeah. So you can visit the dot com for more info and to sign up for only five ninety nine a month. Yep. See you there. All right, let's get started with true crime. All right, so we have an update about that guy that, if you remember, he took he was driving in a Tesla with his whole family, and he drove them off of a cliff trying to kill all of them. But because Teslas have this, like, really advanced technology, they were able to figure out that he intentionally did it and nothing would have caused him to swerve or no accident could have occurred that made them go off the cliff. But they all survived. So now that time has gone by, a judge has decided that this guy, instead of being prosecuted for the crimes, is going to serve two years in a mental health facility for this. So what do you think about that? I think it's fucking ridiculous, honestly. Like, they're saying he has major depression, right? Yeah. If you could if you could interview any person that's done a murder-suicide of their family, I bet all of them have some kind of depress depression or major depressive disorder well, right like, i think anybody could argue come on. if you're gonna take the steps to try to kill anybody at all something's clearly not going smooth in your brain so like i don't understand why this guy's getting a pass this guy was a doctor i'm starting to feel that something's going on behind the scenes like he knew the judge or somebody like you know shook a hand of somebody else behind the scenes and they're letting him off lightly the prosecution is pissed about this obviously this he tried to kill multiple people and they have proof i think i i honestly think that a big thing in this case was didn't didn't the wife say that she didn't want him to go to jail or something oh i don't remember that i yeah i i really think that that happened i remember we reported that she she wanted him to get treatment and stuff so that could have been the major factor in them deciding to do something like that because she didn't even she really felt that he was mentally ill and 
which is is understandable you know what i mean like people people are mentally ill and do horrible shit but then like then let's just like not prosecute anyone ever again that's how i look at it all right so i i just don't agree with this decision like a you're gonna like let this guy try to kill your children and then i i don't understand what two years in a mental health facility is gonna do i don't think he's going to be in a mental health facility I think that he's going to be staying with his parents and having okay, treatment at a is, mental health this place. This is even more different. He's not than... allowed this. He's not allowed to see his family in those two years, but he has to stay with his parents, and he's going to get weekly treatment to try to to heal. Weekly him. treatment. But he's like I. Yeah, that's what I it said. Consider... <laughs> it said it said weekly mental health and therapy. I sessions. consider myself to be a semi-normal person, and I get therapy once a month. So, like, th- that's and I haven't even tried to harm anybody. There, there's a lots of there's a lots of people that get treatment once a week, and I just think, I, I think it's setting a precedent for like, okay, because really any person that kills a person, somebody's going to have an excuse as to why they did it, right? So. And depression, I think, is especially with murder, suicide, because I feel like when you go in knowing that you're going to kill yourself and then you're going to take people down with you, I feel like it's always a, a case like that, that you you have that underlying thing that you want to kill yourself anyway, whereas you're not just going on a shooting spree and just it, like it like evil intentionally just trying to kill people. I, the, the murder suicide thing within families and stuff is is complex and it it always has to do with that kind of stuff right so this the guy's out of work he 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 thinks his wife's cheating on him he's depressed he wants to kill her and the kids like why is this any okay different? so this guy gets to go to therapy once a week for two years right and then what he just he just goes on to live a normal life his kids have to live with the fact that their father tried to kill them for the rest of their lives I, I I don't know. I don't know how people I, live. I just like, don't agree with this. You could argue. It, it's not even an argument. Everybody that kills somebody clearly has something going on in their brain, right? Like a, a normal sane person would not commit an act like that. So if we're going to have this argument, like why can't he be in jail for trying to take the lives of multiple people well, and receive I, treatment? I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that. Like, because there's clearly a difference between people that have diagnosed mental health disorders like schizophrenia bipolar whatever and then people that are just truly evil and they don't really have that underlying thing so the major depression falls into that category right but but major depression can be seen in like a a big percentage of people right so but what it's the same as this. It, 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 they're saying it's like on the same level as if a schizophrenic person it bludgeoned someone to death because they were hearing voices that they should do it. Like that's the line. I understand they're taking. that, but like, are they then going to let a schizophrenic person go back into society without treatment in two years? Like they're going to do something again? Well, yeah, yeah, but they do. That's like you can. That's why they do the insanity defense, right? It's kind of like on that line. They're, but then they're using the, that like this guy wasn't making a decision because he wasn't in the clear state of, in a normal state of mind. But in this case, like he was. That's, but that's in this argument, should that person then have a right to walk amongst society if they're trying to commit crimes against other people because they're insane? Well, yeah, they're doing a diversion program. So they think they're going to be able to like save him and, and make and his what brain if they different. don't save him. Well, th- they said that after that, they're going to reevaluate after the two years to see if he's I, I better. I just cannot agree with this decision. Like, I don't know. I, I just, I, it, if they do it and it proves to work, I'll admit I was wrong, but I just cannot see how this is nearly long enough time to try to take the lives of multiple people. I actually feel really bad for his wife because you're in a tough situation where you love someone and clearly they're mentally ill, but then they also tried to hurt you and your children. And the way I look at it, like myself, is just like, I don't care how much I love you. Like you tried to hurt my kids. Fuck you yeah. kind of thing. But she's in a spot because she doesn't like what decision does she make? She's not really going to make the right decision. I personally wouldn't want like, I wouldn't want my kids to grow up without a dad, but I also don't think that I would want my kids to grow up with a dad that tried to kill 
me and and them. I mean, like we could all have this story now because these people are like don't really have any problems physically. But think about if one of the children were like paralyzed and in a wheelchair for the rest of their life or or worse, dead. One of them was dead. One of them survived. Would that change things for the mom? I don't know. Like, I feel like she's kind of like, oh, we're not that hurt. I don't know. I, 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 just, I don't even I don't know. know. Like, I really just can't imagine, like, if, if Gabe did something like that to us, I can't imagine going to court and being on his side. I just, like, I can't. Well, I, I don't I care. I can't either. And even, even if you're on the side of you don't want them in jail, I would, you would have to say that the person needs to go into a treatment facility, not, like... Like, I feel like that's kind of a sweetheart deal. Like, oh, you get to live with your parents and see a therapist once a week? Yeah, well, I take care of the kids that now you're not around anymore and they're, like, healing from this accident. And this is, like, not something I think... I don't think when you're my age... Like, how old were these kids? Teenagers or little kids? No, they were little kids. Okay, I don't think when you're, like, 30, you're like, oh, my dad tried to drive us off a cliff one time. Like, I don't think you're ever going to get over something like that. That's trauma you're just going to deal with forever. That's what I'm saying, though. Like, it, it doesn't matter, though. Like, the, the the moms in the mom and the kids are in this situation no matter what happens. Like, it, there there is no getting over it. We we report stories of this every week of like terrible shit happening and just being like, God, imagine growing up and know that your dad did that to your mom or whatever. Like, it it just is what it is. I don't. Maybe they're trying to start some new thing to see if they can heal people because. People sitting in jail for their whole life either isn't helpful. I mean, he had to know he's an educated person. He had to know that if this wasn't going to get the job done and they survived, that he would be facing consequences like that. So jail isn't necessarily going to deter people from doing something like this. So it's not going um, to deter him from doing it. I'm I don't. I just him doing something again. Well, well, yeah, because I think I think he was originally saying he was depressed because of the COVID pandemic and this and that. There was like all these excuses he had, which guess what? Like join the club. So was everybody else. It freaking sucked to go through for yeah. all of us. So get over it. That That's number one. But I, you have to think like, OK, he's like I feel like he's like my age. He's around 40, whatever. Like there's going to be something else that happens in our lifetime that's going to make you depressed again. So. You you have to be like able to overcome that. And maybe the wife feels a certain way because she knew he was bad and kind of ignored it. Like there's a lot of variables that we don't know about, you know? Yeah, I don't know. Like I'm interested. I, I'll be keeping my eye on this. I'm just interested in two years, like what they're going to come to terms with. Like, I don't know. It kind of reminds me of that case that we reported on before about that Remember that woman stabbed that guy all those times and she was like high on marijuana and she got off of it because they were saying she had like cannabis induced psychosis. And it was just like it it wasn't really her fault that she did that. I just think from the victim standpoint, like let's say, for example, this wife really wanted to press charges against him. How would you feel if if he got out of this? Knowing that he tried to kill you, he tried to kill your kids, and all he's going to do is like get treatment for two years. It's not. It's not good for the victims, no that's, matter no matter how the victims feel about it. That's what I'm saying. It. Like I, I don't know. Like and I don't. I, like and I'm it. just saying. Like I, I understand depression is a really severe condition for a lot of people, but if he was schizophrenic, would it be the same thing? And they would just let him back in society to maybe repeat the same offense? I just, I don't know. I don't know how this would be handled. Yeah, they would. They would treat they would give him treatment and hopefully like he would take medications and get under control. That's I guess that's what they're they're thinking of. I don't know. Well, whatever. All right. So in April, a fifty three year old man was found dead in his apartment. He had stab wounds, he had blunt injuries to his head, and the weirdest part of this was his right thumb had been cut off. What do you use your right thumb for? To get into your iPhone. (laughs) So (laughs) it turns out a couple months later. Wait, you do? I I can't even think of, wait, I guess you do. No, isn't it? Like, I don't know, because does it use your If you have a newer iPhone, you use your face to get in. But like, we just got my mother-in-law a more basic 
iPhone and you still use your thumb to get in. That was the older model of the phone. And some of the more basic models of the iPhone still have the thumb entry where you use your like fingerprint to get in, right? Okay. So this guy's thumb is missing. And then it turns out a couple months later, these two girls get arrested and they had cut his thumb off and were using it. Well, they had stolen his phone as well. And they were using the thumb to get into his phone to steal his money out of his bank accounts. That's that is just so gnarly. Like it really is. Yeah. And so the body goes to the medical examiner's office and this guy's missing his thumb and it's a clean cut. Why is he missing his thumb? It looks like it just got cut off, you know, and what so that what they would do is look at the end or the margin of it under the microscope to see if it got cut off before he died, if it got cut off after he died, like what was going on. And when they look because there's all different reasons, I guess you could get an amputation on your thumb, but you could tell the difference between like, okay, this person had surgery because it would have been sewn up and stuff. Not just like a raw, a raw cut, you know. Um, and when they looked at it under the microscope, they saw some hemorrhage, and they were like, "Okay, it either got cut off right as he was dying or right after he died. There wasn't a ton of bleeding. Like, oh, he was still actively alive, but it was like maybe because he was he had blunt trauma, so maybe it was like when he was taking his last breaths or shortly after he died. So it was a fresh cut. And j- just think about it though, like once that that thumb is removed from the blood supply it starts decomposing so it's it's essentially like you're cutting around like a a, a chicken drumstick with you right (laughs) i mean when it's not refrigerated and stuff over a couple days just think about like that thing started smelling it started decomposing and then you're going to have the issue of skin slippage which is when the epidermis separates from the dermis as part of the decomposition process which would take the fingerprints off of it if if that actually happens, if they weren't, so I don't know if they like put it in alcohol and preserved you, it. Like these I don't people know what that are did. doing this, like are thinking about skin slippage and I I don't well no I don't think they were thinking of it, but then they had it for a day or two and were like oh shit this thing's starting to really smell and get weird looking and I don't know what they did with it. Like how long were they using it? They had to do something to preserve it well, if if they, they were using it caught. for days so in a row. So he was found in the beginning of April, dead, and the first girl didn't get arrested till June, so at least two months. And then the second perpetrator didn't get arrested till like ten days ago. So I don't know. Yeah, but that doesn't really say how long they were using no, it. No, but but and and yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I just I think it probably. St- it's p- people people are smart though they think like okay this is like a piece of chicken like what would you do with it they probably like used it and put it back in the refrigerator or something i, mean, I don't as know as far as we know they only could have used it one time to transfer money to them right like you but why cut it off why not just unlock it at the scene did they did they find the thumb i don't think they found the thumb but they found so this guy had a history with one of the women and he had reported last year that she stole $1,600 from him, which why are you still seeing her? So he's like hanging out with this chick. They see on surveillance video that she goes back to the apartment with him and then they see on surveillance at the apartment building that these two women and then two other masked men are going in and out of the apartment around the time he died and afterwards. And then they're going through the apartment and there's all this stuff missing, including his phone. And then that's when they figured out that they were transferring money to themselves to use to buy Uber or I guess they were linking his accounts to their Uber's account and to buy weed and booze and all this other stuff. How do you think you're not going to get I don't know. I don't understand. Like, like clearly it's he died on this day. So anything that's happening on his account is fraudulent because he's dead. Like what? Why? Why do you think you're getting away with this? People are just like so dumb. They really are. I can't imagine they were using it that long because they're saying the coroner saying they found him like within a couple days of him dying. So don't you think any transactions afterwards they would know immediately were flagged? But I don't know. know. Like I don't know what police are looking into. Are they looking at bank accounts? I just don't know. So it. So there's like a thumb in a Ziploc bag in someone's purse or. In the refrigerator next to the milk and eggs. Don't you like, think if you were smart, you would just, you know, th- commit the crime and then immediately take the person's thumb, open their phone and just do it right then and there and like leave it all and then peace out. 
instead of yeah, they're clearly cutting not, the thumb they're off and continuously smart. using it. It just it's it's like work smarter, not harder. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay, so this this one is deeply disturbing for me because I used to live literally like two minutes from this. So there's a Dollar Tree in South Philly. It was less than five minutes away two minutes about drive I would walk there all the time about a 10 minute walk from where I used to live for a while and I went there a couple times because we used to have people over for the Eagles game all the time and I would get like plates there and I went to the post office next door so I'm very familiar with the shopping center in particular so like me this lady's just walking around the dollar store shopping and all of a sudden this man comes up to her and ejaculates on her leg how like he just he how do you pull it out and make it come out that fast just i i don't know i i just want to know how it went down like she was just standing there and he came up and did that or was he doing it for you a have while to only imagine that he was probably fondling himself like through his pants until he was at the a point where he was about to ejaculate and then went up to her and did it on her leg and i'd have to cut my leg off if this happened to me yeah, and so there was a video going around that went viral, and it was her chasing the guy out of the store and just freaking out, which any person would be freaking out and saying, like, he nutted on my leg he, and was showing the stuff, like, on her leg. And, yeah, there's no amount of, like, I'd have to get a trash can and fill it with bleach and stick my leg in it, and I, I there's no amount of cleaning that off it's just yeah, so, so gross. this video that goes viral she started taking a video when she was mid freak out after realizing what happened to her and it's him running out of the store and her chasing him and then she starts sobbing obviously because that's absolutely horrible to happen to somebody so you know it this actually happened a couple of weeks ago but i guess the video just went viral this week and then meek mill the rapper reposted it which is why it went like super viral and then the police posted surveillance footage of him and he turned himself in yesterday. Really, the best part of this story is that in June, he was wearing a T-shirt. In In this video, he was wearing a T-shirt with a candy cane on it that said, quote, it's not going to lick itself. So next time you're at the store and you see a person really ever wearing a shirt like this because it's totally corny, These shirts are getting out of control. They're just so, like, what is the point of that? I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of, it's just not even funny. Like, it's, it's just not funny. I don't, I really just don't get the joke in it. This is a horrific crime. I mean, I understand. It's a sexual assault. it totally is. I understand why she would take a video of him to try to have it for evidence, but I certainly would not be posting a video of somebody else's semen on my leg. No, I think it's great that she did that, honestly. I don't know. Because that's... No, it's it's good because she made it... I, I'm, not, I'm happy because in that heat of that moment, I don't know if I would have even thought about pulling out my phone like that. And I think that it just adds to how disgusting the crime is. And she wanted to show everyone, like, this really happened. And that's what made it start going viral because it just made it even more gross. You know what I mean? And that really pisses people off. Either if you're a woman or you have female children or anything, like, even it could happen to a guy, too. Just, like, it's it's just, it's, it's not... Uh, it's hard to describe how gross it is. And then seeing it, I think, helps even more, honestly. what We used to know a lady that was in the subway once and, and a guy like was sit, like a guy was sitting on the, the um, steps and she was walking up the steps and he just like pulled it out and started jerking off and like ejaculated all over the place, like right in front of her. And hearing that story to me is so disturbing. But if I saw like a photo of it, I'd be like, Oh my god, that's it just makes it even more real and imagine being in a situation like that like you're just at the dollar store and then something nasty like that happens to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it was good that she showed it honestly. Yeah, I mean, when I, I 
I first saw this story and then when I, I just saw South Philadelphia Dollar Tree or whatever, right, at first. And then when I looked and saw what location it was, I was like, this, you have to be joking. Like, I've been to that store so many times, that exact location. I just can't even imagine. All right, let's get into medical news. A new study has detected concentration of 16 metals in different kinds of tampons. How did metals even end up in tampons? It's because of the fibers and stuff they use. So they're they're detecting these in tampons right now. This study has shown, and they haven't said yet that these metals are affecting women's health. They're trying to investigate that now. And the reason is, is because all of these metals could also be in in like panties and jeans and stuff that are also very close to your vagina. So they want to make sure that when they do test to see if any of these metals are in people's blood, that it's coming from the tampons and not a combination of the tampons and the clothes that people are wearing. But the 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 vagina really absorbs things like that, like more than if you put something on your hand, for example, like the vagina will absorb more. So as opposed to like holding a tampon. And one of the, the biggest concerns, too, is that women wear these things for multiple years of their life. And they think that there's like almost 50 to 85 percent of women at some point wear tampons, you know, every month. It's a it's a lot of product. So there was news coming out. Remember that there were PFAs in those kinds of period pad underwear and stuff, which are like the forever chemicals. And it's good that they're doing studies like that to see because like being exposed to something like this for multiple years at a time can could turn into cancer one day or cause long-term health problems. And one of the most important things that came from this study, because, you know, people always say, well, like, I use organic cotton ones. They're fine. And it's like, no, actually, they're not. They said that women that were using just like regular tampons, they had a more increase of lead in those but the organic cotton ones had an increase of arsenic. Well, I'm so, one of those people that uses the organic tampons, so I don't feel good about well, this. That I I think that we know now that that could be said about anything. I I honestly feel like the whole organic thing is just a bunch of bullshit. It's just like everything costs more money, and it's like it's the same with food and everything. You've you like you think it's better, but it's kind of like not really better. Um, so. So, yeah, it's just something to to keep an eye on because I know so many women use them because the, the, the stuff pours out of your body so much. There's like no way that they're like, what else can you do? Right. Well, I know you can't wear a pad sometimes or you would be you you would not be able to function all day because it's pouring I out. I feel of like you. a lot of people will be like, well, I wear the cup, blah, blah, blah. But can't there be these similar problems with the cups, too, and how they're manufacturing them and the plastic? And- well, they're they're plastic. Yeah, they're plastic. So it's. Uh, right now, there might not be any like like perfect thing. I don't. I really don't know. It, yeah. It's just. And, and think about this too. Like this is this is kind of a new pro a newer problem in the history of humans because there wasn't tampons forever, right? So women weren't using things like this. They were using things made of like real cotton that came from a field and was made and things like that. And, yeah, but we, you know, the rag. Yeah, but we even talked about that story last week where that woman was using cloth. I mean, she wasn't like properly washing it and everything, but these newer tampons and pads have these specific design that they're like sanitary and they're disposable and everything. So I think you could argue with even older methods like using organic cotton and whatever like they could still have problems in some capacity with them not being properly washed or like the detergent you're using to wash them or the soap you're using like oh yeah but i'm just talking about like chemicals that are getting absorbed it, you know they there there's all of these studies that are being done that's saying that we're that we're having increased risk of cancer in younger people and i think that this is what the whole point of this study is to kind of see like is this what is causing it? Is this a factor in what's causing it? Because like something's yeah. causing it. No, totally. So in March, we talked about a patient who had received a pig kidney transplant. I believe he was the third patient to get it ever. And there's been four patients that have now had it, but they have all died within two months of getting the transplant. 
So there's about 100,000 people that are on the, the transplant list at least and to get a new organ. And sometimes people aren't considered eligible, like older people that they think, okay, if we give this, like, let's say, for example, you needed a kidney. Didn't like Selena Gomez get a kidney transplant? Yeah. So she was, she has lupus and she was very young and she needed it, but she was otherwise healthy. So they look at her and they say, okay, she's very young. If she gets a kidney transplant, there's like a very high probability of her surviving another 50 years. So let's give it to her first because she's a good candidate for it. Whereas some people that need it might be like 65 and, they, and they're not really in good health. And they think if they gave that same kidney to that person, they might only live two years. And it's kind of a waste of an organ. Like this is how they have to do it just based upon how many people need an organ. So... In these cases, they were they're thinking like, okay, we're gonna transplant pig organs and try to see if that will work because then we will have access to so many more organs for people that are even considered maybe at like a low risk of surviving something like this. So it does make sense that some of these people that opted to get this very experimental treatment did it because otherwise they were gonna die anyway because they weren't gonna get a kidney. So I, I would have did it too if they if they said, okay. You're either going to die in three months because you're, you, you're in kidney failure or you could try this and have a chance of surviving. Like, of course, you're going to do that. Right. And it was a very important thing to for these people to be like human guinea pigs for for science. And it will help in the future to to try to see what went wrong. They'll do autopsies on all these people and and really examine the organs and see why they failed. And I think it's a good step. It's kind of cool that they were even able to make people live for a couple months on it. So there needs to be like a lot more done. But it, but I mean, this is how medicine works. And sometimes the only way you could experiment is on real people. You just can't simulate yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that they lived at least two months proves that there's some success behind it. They just, you know, they're still ironing it out. It's like a brand new revolutionary surgery. So they just have to, you know, take this, like what you said, take this, see what went wrong, and try to progress on that until they have the perfect recipe for it. Yeah. Okay, so a new study has come out revealing the truth behind the pool smell that we are all familiar with. A study was done that says that it's not, whenever you smell pool and you smell that strong chlorine smell, it's not actually the chlorine itself, but it's chemical byproducts that are given off when chlorine mixes with body fluids especially urine it that is disgusting it's disgusting but i don't 100 percent agree with this because when you go to the pool store which i've been to many times over the past couple of months the whole store smells so strong like chlorine and clearly like that's not even mixed in water yet like those chemicals just smell strong in the store they have a very specific smell what happened to like when you used to pee in a pool and it would turn dark blue when did that, that was happen? like a thing and it was always like don't pee in the pool cuz you don't know which pool is going to have this chemical in it that's going to dye the water this color and like embarrass you <laughs> I, I literally have never heard of that. I, I don't it's know. It's been depicted in movies and stuff, too. But I remember remember that place, um, Soupy Island, that like Joan and Joe used to take me to? Yeah. I feel like that pool had it. I don't know. Is is that just like some wives' <laughs> tale that old people used to tell you so you wouldn't pee in the pool? I've, I don't know. I've never heard of It probably is that, a so. wives' tale. But yeah, like when I was a little kid, it was the, th the thing when I was a little kid in like the mid to late 90s was don't pee in the pool because you don't know if it's going to turn dark blue and then everybody will know you peed in the pool. Oh, I don't, I don't know. But, well, we, I could look into that later. But when you have... So when you mix chlorine, this is how they did the study. They mixed it with uric acid, which can be found in urine and sweat, but there's like so much more of it in urine. And when they mix it, it, it causes a ke chemical like a byproduct, which is called trichloramine and cyogen chloride. And those two byproducts of the mixture of these things is now this is something I do believe it gives off a, a vapor that causes eye irritation, difficulty breathing. And they even say that people, that studies have been done with people that are in the pool a lot, 
um, swimmers, children, things like that. They have a higher increase of asthma, lung disease. It, it's kind of interesting. And I, I do hear that sometimes. Like when I did always think when you went to the public pool that maybe they just put extra chlorine in because there was so many people because the public pools definitely have an like an extra strong when you walk by it you're like whoa especially like a water park it like it it's very you know an indoor water park that's enclosed it it almost feels like you're breathing in chemicals like it's too much yeah so that does make sense to me that maybe it is especially with all those people that it's urine mixed with the chemical that it you know you know if you breathe in like menthol like that that like it burns your like throat a little bit when you breathe yeah. it in i i get that like when we went to that horrible place on earth the wolf lodge place <laughs> jesus christ why i'll you never go back there, there again. i i don't know either but that place when we walked in to this enclosed water park it like took my breath away of how strong the chemicals were to the point i said to gabe like is this just like is something not right is this too much like this is really bothering me right now um so i i guess that that kind of makes sense but i i also just think that the chemical itself is is strong too so um i don't know but one of lillian's friends actually said to us the other day like how come when i open my eyes underwater in your pool it doesn't burn my eyes where and she said like when she goes to the the public pool it does so i thought that was kind of interesting yeah it is i mean another interesting thing this article said was that a lot of people substitute taking showers with going in the pool and that about 40 percent of people surveyed in 2019 said they had peed in the pool at some time so i mean that doesn't surprise are, me are those is, are those percentages my children because like once the summer starts you're just like hey have you taken a shower <laughs> this week at all and and you, you know you'll say to them like did you take a shower? No, I went in the pool. But I remember being a kid and saying that too. I don't, so th that's let them be I, kids. We think that's more unique to children because every time I go swimming, I like feel I have to take a shower after. You just have that like grossness on you. I don't know. Yeah, I I went swimming yesterday and and yeah, it's like your hair is like kind of ratty. No, my hair and gets it's just... like really rubbery, so I have to take a shower every time we go swimming. I don't know. But children just don't right. care about stuff like that. <laughs> Duh. All right, let's get into other death news. So the mass shooter of the Parkland school shooting from 2018 is in a civil suit with one of his many victims. And they have come to this unique settlement conclusion where he is going to donate his brain to science to be looked at. Th this is great. I, I think that this is great. The only negatives I have for it, which makes me think that it might not really even help. I know it'll make the victims feel better and everything, but this guy, he's only 25 years old, right? Yeah, and he is serving he's in life jail, in prison. Life in prison. So he could live another 50 years, another 60 years. So we're not, we might not even see this happen for such a very long time. And in that time, uh, the good part is, I guess, is that a lot of, a lot of advancements in science will be made, obviously. So, like, maybe I'm talking out of line here as far as the capabilities of what we have right now. But there's always this thing with brain injuries that it's like nature versus nurture. Like, does he have something wrong with his brain anatomically, which is what we would be able to see now doing the studies, even physiologically, like that's how the brain works or is it a nurture thing, which is like this kid was born into a, a screwed up situation. He and we don't real I don't know if we know much about his parents, but he was put in an orphanage when he was born. So I don't know what kind of parents he came from, but that's another thing. Like, were they addicts? Did they have mental health issues? I don't know. But he got adopted and then both of his adopted parents died. One of them had died a year prior to him doing this mass shooting and then on top of that it was like this kid had behavioral problems in school his entire life he was moved around to six different schools with ADHD at some point he was diagnosed with autism he had all the uh, depression this and that so he was a, a troubled child his entire life so what I'm trying to say is I'm not exactly sure that 
looking at his brain is going to really help with that because it could just be because of all the trauma he experienced in his life. Yeah, I guess it's just interesting because, like, the brain is just so, like, you know, it's still so foreign, even though we have all this science and everything now, they just still aren't really sure how everything works. So I think for them to just have access to something like this could be a cool opportunity for scientists to try to see if there's any glaring thing that's going on and try to compare it to other people. I mean, like you said, he could live for another 50 years, though, and then we're not looking at this for 50 years. So I think their hope is to try to look at this brain and see if they can see anything to prevent this from happening in the future. But that's a decades away. And, I mean, we have in the I mean, this is how we learned about CTE and chronic traumatic encephalopathy and stuff because of doing autopsies on people who had you know, chronic traumatic brain injuries. And then you're like, oh, they went nuts towards the end of their life. Like what happened? Let's look at their brain. And then you look and you could see those changes under the microscope, which is like, wow. Okay. So this person definitely had a history of multiple blows to the head. And then we're seeing these changes under the microscope. So I, I mean, I, I would be so happy if this was helpful and they, they really should try to do this more because maybe you just have this guy now which that brain's coming in another however many years. I mean, he could also die next week. You just don't know. But also just other people like serial killers. Uh, Can we get Brian Koberger's brain? Like stuff like that. And that really might help. So hopefully with the advancement of science and everything in the future, we can learn more from looking at these yeah, things. Yeah, I mean, I think from a law perspective, this was just awesome to like have a settlement go this way. I've never heard of something like this. So I think that's a really good achievement for the victim's lawyers. I am interested to see if we'll try to bargain that later with serial killers and other people that commit crimes. It's It could be really cool study to look at over time and just see if there's any really obvious side effects of this. Yes, yeah, totally. So our last story today is about this woman that died in the Milwaukee area and her family is having quite a lot of problems with her funeral arrangements. So why is that? She was 850 pounds and died at home. So there's multiple issues that go into trying to handle a body of this size. And Gabe's had to deal with this uh, several times as a firefighter trying to get a person not even nearly this big out of the house. Because you have to think like men and women, fire departments. I mean, it's just like 850 pounds is a lot of weight to carry. And especially... Sometimes it's a person that lives on a second floor in a row house, for example, and there's a skinny staircase and there's just all of these things that you just physically cannot get a person out of their house. So that's the first challenge. And then the second challenge is that person has to then be transported somewhere and then they have to be either embalmed or buried right away or cremated. And in this case, there was a funeral home that said they could not accommodate them. And then there was a crematorium that said they could not accommodate a person of this size. And it it makes sense to me. I've had this situation happen before when I had to do an autopsy, I said, on a person that was over 500 pounds in the refrigerator at the hospital because the, the um, gurney that they were on or the stretcher they were on wouldn't fit into the morgue because... When the morgue was designed, it just wasn't designed for stretchers and, and gurneys that were that big because back in the 1950s, this was the morgue I was working in, the people weren't that big. Yeah. So you're starting to see now when you, I see it anyway, when you go to the doctor's offices and stuff, it's like, especially like urgent care, for example, it's like the chairs in the waiting room are bigger. The, the tables that patients sit on are bigger because it's like people are getting bigger. So they're trying to accommodate it. So when we had a new morgue that was made in a newer hospital I worked in, we had something called a bariatric table, autopsy table, which was like twice as wide as the autopsy tables that we had at the older hospitals. And that happens sometimes, too, that the person's even so big they don't even fit on that. And we just have to cut them in the, the gurney that they go in the refrigerator on. So, um, and, and the same could be said about funeral homes, right? You have, I mean, all of the funeral homes around here, especially like the two that are within walking distance of my house, 
They're in old Victorian homes. They're just not made to have a refrigerator that big. They just and you can't have a human in a, a funeral home that's not in a refrigerator. So there's all of these things. And then the same can be said about a crematorium. It's just not big enough to fit a stretcher that big. Like this this is what happens. And so the mom wants to see if there could be something done because she had such a terrible time just trying to get her daughter the final services for her daughter because well, of this. Well, yeah, and I think the family alluded also that because of how long it took her to get out of the house and then with, you know, having the fire department having to get her out and how long just the whole process took, they couldn't even have a funeral like they wanted. And I'm assuming that's because it took so long that maybe she was decomposing and that they weren't yeah. able to have a viewing because of how that developed. Well, one of the things you have to take into consideration is that bigger people take longer to decompose because what happens is your body stays way warmer than a, than an average size body after you die, which then increases bacterial growth and causes it causes bloating, it causes it, it causes the skin to start decomposing, right? And and turning green and the skin slippage and everything like that. So there's all these factors in the consideration, but just just to think about how difficult it is for the fire department to get someone of that size out of the house and transport them somewhere they can fit. Yes, the the woman decomposed. And honestly, like even if she got to a funeral home that could accommodate that, what is, I don't even know the process of trying to embalm a person that's that big because when you embalm someone, you put it, you put the chemicals through their circulatory system and it goes through all the way from like their arteries all the way down to like literal arterioles, like these little blood vessels and capillaries and stuff. And when a person is that big, I just don't know that the tissue ever gets fully soaked in with all those chemicals that you would even be able to give that person a viewing like that anyway. I mean, that would be something obviously to ask a funeral director, but I just think that that might be uh, really difficult to do. So anyway. sorry, I didn't. I don't think I heard you earlier. So are you saying if the larger you are, the faster you decompose, or the slower you decompose? Well, it it the process is like because of your heat and everything like that. It just takes a, it. It's it keeps the bacteria growing and everything like that. So it kind of like accelerates okay. it. You know what I mean? Like a, as far as I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but let's say you have a person at your size and a person that's 500 pounds. Like you're they're going to turn green and start bloating more faster because of all the bacteria growth because when you if if you do an autopsy on a person of your size the day after their, their body's going to be pretty cold. You could do an autopsy on a person the day after a heavy person like that. And like you open them up and like the inside of their body is like still hot. And that's that that heat just accelerates the bacterial yeah. growth. Okay. So she she would have to get put right into refrigeration. And like I said, I don't know what the deal is with the embalming and stuff like that. But it's just not as simple as like, you know. Uh, nanny and pop died at the house the funeral home came and picked them up within an hour took them stuck them in the refrigerator the whole thing was done in two or three hours mm -hmm. right but but like this person it's like no you can't you can't just get her out of the house fast and even transport her fast you'd have she probably had to get put put in some like really big truck or a van or something like she wouldn't fit in a standard size transport vehicle anyway it's just there's a lot of factors to it yeah. because and and if she was, I, you said she was in Milwaukee yeah. or something, or like if it was the city of Milwaukee versus like one of these little volunteer fire departments on the side, like they might not even have the equipment or the staff necessary to move someone of that size. So th the whole thing could just take hours. And I understand that this is like kind of a rare situation, and but this mom, uh, if she wants there to be a procedure for this, I think that she's probably right because this is not the only time that stuff like this happens. And the fact that like so many people are morbidly obese now, I feel like maybe there should be a procedure in place, but well, I don't, like you said, she's not like trying to sue or anything. I she? don't think so. But I think like you said, like we clearly see this shift in the world because 
you know, a lot of these doctor's offices and facilities like where you worked and your morgue were, were designed in the 50s when obesity it wasn't such a thing. And that's because, you know, processed foods are a large contributing factor to that, right? So it's like you have to think with how our culture has cha changed, they also have to change how they're handling certain things. I mean, I feel like it, there are definitely a lot of obese people in the world. I feel like this is a pretty unique situation like i know there's other people that are this size but i haven't heard of something like this before but they definitely should be taking it as an example to alter their protocols yeah sure because for me i feel like this is like not happening every day right with a person of this size but with the rate people are gaining weight and everything and with the obesity crisis we're having in the united states they do need to look at that and figure out how they're affect it or how they're responding to these calls it's scary for the mom's perspective because if you think about like it's already upsetting that your daughter died right and then to think that there were periods where she was like i don't even know where she's going i don't know what they can do i don't know if they could do anything for me it, it it's i guess like i could see that that's why she doesn't know she's just being a mom like hey like if this happens to someone else, how could this go smoother? I shouldn't have to call all around and figure out what they can do. I mean, and my first thought was like, if they can't even get her out efficiently when she's passed away, what if she was alive and they called an ambulance, right? Well, this the same shit happens. It's the same thing. Yeah. So, and, I mean, that's you. You can't be an eight hundred and fifty pound human. Like it doesn't. It doesn't work. No. no for, for for the rest of the no, world. No. Totally. But like, yeah. I don't know. I I would be interested to see if she goes forward and tries to push new policies. I don't know. I just don't even know how they would do it because I'm thinking about how houses are designed and just a lot has to change for this particular situation to go smoother. So like, I don't really. I don't have a grasp of how things would change necessarily right now. But I, d I think it's a unique case. I think it's important we're talking about it. It's just interesting how it all went down, really. Yeah. Okay, on to questions of the day. Every Friday at the At Mother Knows Death Instagram account, we put a little question box up in the story, and you guys can ask whatever you want. First, how come dead people float, but when you're alive, you can't float? Well, that's because when we were just talking about this with the, the decomposition process and stuff, so that's what gets it started is the bacteria that's inside. Everyone has bacteria in their body, especially in their colon. And when that bacteria is getting pooped out and stuff, everything's fine. But like, think about when you, like yesterday, I had terrible gas. I don't know what the hell I ate. I had a um, tofu scramble. It was probably the soy that was whatever. Not to but, cut you off, but, but I have a theory it was the pizza on Monday because I had that horrible migraine Tuesday and that was the only thing I ate that I didn't cook myself. Well, what I, whatever. The whole point is, is that when you ever have that gas in your belly where you feel like your belly is like so distended with yes. air, that that's because of the bacteria in inside of your colon. So when you die, that bacteria then can start to multiply and it causes gas to be released, the toxins that are released from these bacteria. And they cause air to accumulate within the body, which makes you like more buoyant, like a float. You become a float. And that's what happens. So, you know, if you drown and stuff, you'll sink down for a while because your body is heavier than the water weight. And then all of this air fills up in you and now you're lighter. So you float to the top. All right, next. Can you talk a bit about trichobezoars? Have you seen them? Yeah, so a trichobezoar is a hairball. That's all that means. And yeah, I mean, they. what happens is that in, in all of these cases is that it's a, it's a mental health condition called trichotillomania, and that is when people have a compulsion to pull out their hair. And then... Trichophagia is when the people pull out their hair and then they eat their hair. And what happens is that the keratin protein in the hair can't be broken down by the stomach acid. So it just sits in the stomach. And think about like eating hair, eating hair over time. 
the hair never gets digested and it just sits in the stomach and it calls it causes a bezoar or a bezoar is a like a Don't ball. Do you have a case of this of in hair. the book? Yeah, I have a case of it in the book and I have multiple cases. I just posted a case like two weeks ago in the grocery room, like a really, really advanced case. And what happens is that the hair can start, once it fills up the stomach, it could start going into the small intestine and it makes almost like a tail of hair that follows the the small intestine. And when you take it out, they consider that, they call that Rapunzel syndrome because it looks like Rapunzel let down your hair, like a big tail of hair going down into oh, this wow. um into the small bale yeah so um it usually it it's it's seen in ch- like children sometimes and and a lot of times the parents know that the kids are doing this clearly because they have huge ball spots on their head and it's it's a really terrible mental health thing i just saw a video of a girl that had it that was saying that she was she would just had this condition and she was pulling out her hair and she just only did it on the top of her head and she she looked bald on the top with this long hair on the bottom and she had to wear this this hair piece to cover the bald spots and um it's a compulsion it's just something that they feel like they can't control doing and um so you know, and, and if you have a person that you know is doing that, this is one of the concerns because they can get really sick with this and they go with stomach pain and then they do the x-ray and they're like, oh, my God, their whole stomach is filled. They have to get surgery and they take it out. And it's it's just really it's really disturbing, you know, and it's sad that people have to go that through that, especially kids. Yeah, for sure. It, so you're saying like it's is it more common in children or it just could happen to anybody the, that has a lot of the cases. Uh, it could happen to anybody, but a lot of the cases that I've seen are in kids. Like, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it could happen to anybody. Though I don't remember how old the person in the book is. I think it was a younger person, though. Honestly, all right. This last question is in reference to this pair you keep referencing. Couldn't the rectum pair just decompose and be pooped out? I would say no. Like, how, if you left a pear on the countertop or something, like, for it to decompose enough to the point where it could be pooped out would be, like, weeks, right? It doesn't shrivel, you know? This pear wasn't, it was like a normal piece of fruit. It was nowhere near the point that it was going to be shriveled up that small for weeks. Like, you can't, how would you live? You'd have to. But let's say. It, it'd have to well, come let's out. let's say you just, you just didn't address it and you just left it be there then you die your bowel would perforate it's <laughs> you can't you can't you can't leave something stuck up your butt because there's already if if you stick something up your butt right there's already poop in there because most people have like you know you let your load out and there's five other ones behind it ready to come out you know i i'm still mind blown it, that so, it's like fully encased in the body oh my god i, I still can't believe so it. if you if you put so you already have like, let's say you eat breakfast, you eat lunch, you eat dinner, and then you go and have sex and had somebody sticks something up your butt, mm-hmm. right? So you didn't poop any of your breakfast, lunch, and dinner out. It's still in there. So that thing is stuck up your butt, right? So now, unless you, even if you never eat again, like that poop wants to come out and eventually it's going to perforate your colon, like... That's what's going to happen. It's just going to be like a severe constipation situation. You're going to have to get surgery to take it out. And you have to eat, right? So you're going to eat the next day. Now you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner again. Now you got six poops behind it. Then you eat the next day. Then you have nine poops behind it. Like, do you understand? Like, it's not, it can't sit there and decompose for, for, it it just, it can't. That's why you have to go to the hospital and get this thing taken out. It's. Didn't they do that in the Jackass movie? One of them stuck like a toy car up their butt or something like that. They're always doing stuff like that. I honestly can't believe there weren't more problems associated with those movies. Yeah, but when I but when I feel like I remember that and then when he went to the hospital, he looked like he was like not happy. Like it was very uncomfortable, which it I imagine that it is. Yeah, everything they do looks massive. Not even that it was a toy car, just like anything, like a dildo would be too. Like it just, 
you know, I guess uh, I, the- I don't know. But like, yeah, you, you have to take it out. There's no like pop up. When I came home and told pop up about the, the, the pear in the butt situation, he was like, listen, if I ever did that, I would die with that pear up my butt because I never would go to the hospital and like be that embarrassed and i'm like yeah you say that but guess what like you would because it would hurt so bad you would just be like fuck this i don't even care what other people think about me i need this thing out of my body imagine the medical examiner getting a person that died they don't know why they died and then finding that discovery yeah i mean i don't i don't even know of any cases of that happening i'm sure like listen like anything this is the the best part of pathology is that anything that your wildest dreams could imagine has happened or will happen (laughs) um i don't know of i don't have any particular cases of um of it technically like i have cases of people dying like after the surgery because it didn't go well or something but I haven't seen any cases of just like, hey, we found this. We had no idea why this person died, but which I will be looking up later to see if I could find any cases. Um, But I I definitely could see that 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 could happen. Like, why not? Anything could happen. All right. Well, on that note, thank you guys so much for listening this week. Definitely check out our last episode of Six Shocking Stories. And if you have a shocking story, please submit it to stories at motherknowsdeath.com. I have that email in the description of the episode on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening. So check that out. Leave us a little teaser in the headline. Send us some photos. Tell us every detail you could think of. We love hearing it. So yeah. And even if you don't have photos, just um still send us it if you have a good story and i will write you back and ask you some questions if i have any questions about it but we love to hear your story so thanks for sharing bye bye thank you for listening to mother knows death as a reminder my training is as a pathologist assistant i have a master's level education and specialize in anatomy and pathology education I am not a doctor and I have not diagnosed or treated anyone, dead or alive, without the assistance of a licensed medical doctor. This show, my website, and social media accounts are designed to educate and inform people based on my experience working in pathology so they can make healthier decisions regarding their life and well-being. Always remember that science is changing every day and the opinions expressed in this episode are based on my knowledge of those subjects at the time of publication. If you are having a medical problem, have a medical question, or are having a medical emergency, please contact your physician or visit an urgent care center, emergency room, or hospital. Please rate, review, and subscribe to Mother Knows Death on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere you get podcasts. Thanks.